Welcome to today's webinar, Tips to Increase Romance Bookings in This New Normal. My name is Paloma Villarreal de Rico, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Recommend Magazine and moderator of this webinar, which has been made possible by Recommend, as well as the following partners, the Beacons of Fort Myers and Sanibel, St. Lucia Tourism Authority, and Figment Design. This webinar is a complement to the Romance Travel Trends Survey that was conducted on Recommend.com, as well as the Romance Travel Trends Report, which you will receive via email. During this conversation with the panelists, we'll speak about romance travel trends and how COVID-19 has impacted how you sell to the romance segment. Before we begin, some housekeeping items. During the presentation, feel free to enter your questions in the question box. We'll gather them together and hold a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Don't worry if you miss something, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link via email to access the recording. <laughs> As an accompaniment to this webinar, a link to the tra Romance Travel Trends Report will be included in the follow-up email. So let's start the webinar by having the panelists introduce themselves. Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Goldstein and I own Journeys in Richmond, Virginia and am a destination wedding and honeymoon specialist. Thank you, Kim and Tom. I'm Varghese with Travel Tom, located in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, also destination and wedding specialist as well. Thank you, Tom. And Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Moss, Senior Sales Manager at the Sale St. Lucia Tourism Authority. I've worked in tourism over 25 years, and I'm looking forward to inspiring you to sell more romance today. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, Kim, Tom, and Richard, for joining us. And uh, let's jump right into it and provide your expertise. So the first question, what was the number one challenge or concern you heard from clients who had booked a destination wedding or a honeymoon when COVID hit? And how did you resolve it or get over the initial hurdle? Who wants to respond to that? Can I? I think, I think the number one thing I heard is to go or not to go. But certainly, we, we see where folks are suffering from a bit of of, of a lack of confidence to travel, first of all. And then certainly if it is that you're doing, let's say a destination wedding, for example, or a trip to some faraway place, then you certainly want to be confident. And if you're taking um, your friends and family, particularly those who may be deemed vulnerable, then that was certainly a very important consideration. And so the number one question was, um, concern was, to go or not to go, to, to defer the trip or to, to change it, you know? And what, were, what was the advice that the destination was providing advisors and or clients? Well, I think for us, I mean, we really have an excellent relationship with our travel partners. And I'm not just saying that. I say that because um, we really try to build a relationship with them. And so the advice was certainly based on who your clients are, you really have to make that decision um, given the dynamics. Every situation is different. Every wedding is different. Every trip is different. Every family is different. And the one thing I, I would drill down to ask is who is that number one non-negotiable guest that needed to be um, at the wedding? And if it was your grandma, then maybe for this particular one, you might want to then defer, which a number of people did and booked um, for the same period the following year or pushed it out a few months based on the information that was available. Because as we all know, COVID was the most fluid situation or is the most fluid situation ever. So yeah, right behind that, yeah, right behind that I would say that um, safety and security was a really important factor. Uh, what is the experience going to be during the travel from the airports to the flights to what the arrival and destination is going to be? So initially it was, do I get on a plane? What are their characteristics going to be? And now most of the destinations have come out with really good protocols on what the experience are going to be. Um, not only the islands, but the resorts themselves. So I think that's going to help alleviate a lot of the concerns for the guests as well as for the couples. 
And I think what I was hearing a lot of was, will I be quarantined when I arrive? What does quarantine mean for that destination and that resort? Does that mean I have to stay in my room? Does that mean I have to stay at my resort? You know, are there tours? Um, also, what happens if I do test positive upon arrival to the island and I have to be quarantined for 14 days? Who pays for it? Where am I staying? So that's what I'm experiencing a lot of right now. The, a lot of people are planning on traveling in the near future, and those are the types of questions I'm getting a lot of. And um, and so are they asking really in depth about this safety protocols? Do you guys send them the link? What do you do? do I mean, obviously you've read through a lot of these, you know, some of them are huge documents, you know, I know because we've also had to do it because we're reporting on it. Um, so how, how in depth are these clients truly asking and how are they, are they okay with these protocols that are being put in place? I can answer that. Um, I find from the resort perspective, they're not asking me a ton of questions. I'm getting more about the destination and what are the pre-travel requirements if they have to have a COVID test because a lot of areas are still trying to figure out how they can actually get a test if they're not exhibiting symptoms. So I'm getting more of those type questions. I feel like they know now they have to wear a mask on the plane. And that is one question they will ask about the resort experience. Where do I have to wear a mask, if at all? Um, but it's mainly, where do I need to get the COVID test? How is that whole process going to work? That's interesting. And um, going back to the destination weddings or honeymoons, um, was how long off how 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 much of a delay are they delaying it for 2021 in terms of destination weddings did they delay most of the weddings to 2021 we had a few push off to a uh, fall of this year where we can secure availability uh, we actually still have a number of weddings that are traveling in the fall of this year most of them did push off to 2021 though okay and you and what about honeymoons kim yeah, honeymoons, it depends on the wedding dates, right? So some of the clients haven't rescheduled their weddings yet, so they haven't rescheduled their honeymoons yet. Um, fortunately for us, a lot of the tour operators that we work with were giving some really good incentives around being able to carry over the insurance, uh, being able to offer additional credit if you carry over to not cancel completely. So this incentivizes a lot of my clients to not cancel their trips completely, but hold the money for, for whenever they decide to go in the future. Did you see the same thing, Richard, on St. Lucia? A lot of people for 2021. I know you mentioned that to me. Well, I must say 2021 is looking very good. But hello, we would like <laughs> we would like um, some uh, to see a similar pattern in 2020 as well. Um, quite a number of folks did differ and again those are based on a case by case and my team has been certainly out there uh, as as have many of the other tourist boards and contacting travel professionals and i really um like to endorse what tom mentioned about the the willingness of suppliers to work with the travel professionals and the flexibility that was required. I mean, giving someone a 500, let's say a $250 credit or $500 credit, I mean, that goes a long way in, in retaining that business. That's very, very important. And, and it also shows the value of the travel professional too, you know, um, because we know that you have worked so very hard. So I, I, I want to say thank you to every travel professional out there we know it's been a really tough time but back to your original question quite a few of them have um, gone in the fall fall as well as festive and winter are now picking up and that's right across the board um, in terms of travel but let me tell you i mean we do some crazy things when we're in love right selling romance that's that's emotive selling i mean it's an emotional purchase and people, I mean, we've been cooped up in the house, right? So the generations also played into it. So those millennials, when they saw those airfares, they were on it. They were not missing out because millennials, they're our children, right? Um, we taught them to live their best lives. And so you find with the millennials, they don't have that um, lack of confidence, that fear factor as much. And so you've seen where they, 
have been just trying to figure out where to place it. And some of those folks are actually traveling very close to the opening of many of the destinations. And I will just backtrack a moment if you allow me. I think as more destinations open up, I mean, I think we're very happy to see that the protocols all come from the World Health Organization and the CDC. So we're all pretty comfortable with that. But certainly destinations are learning from each other as well. I mean, we certainly took a lot of the feedback from our travel professionals and we launched uh, a survey this week to get additional details on how best to market so that we can win together because that is really what our partnership should be about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Kim and Tom, did you guys pivot in terms of future destination weddings or future honeymoons? Is there any pivoting that you're doing besides the safety, the health, obviously giving the protocols, letting people know what's going on? Is there any creative things that you guys are doing with the weddings or, or honeymoons that you wouldn't have done pre? COVID or that people are asking, and so you kind of have to give them some creative twists. Him, Tom, whomever wants to. <laughs> I can go. Um, you know, honestly, most of mine have not, my honeymooners really are just, it's almost like COVID's not going on with them. I mean, if they have to change their wedding, yes, they're, they're really in tune to it. Obviously, they know it's happening, but they're a little bit business as usual. I haven't, I thought people would be asking for, you know, smaller properties and villas and, you know, just more individual type accommodations. And I haven't had that yet, which I'm a little surprised, but, you know, that, that could be coming in the future. So I'm expecting that that will change. Um, they're seeing all the policies on the website. So I think they're very comfortable with the safety protocol and that everything will be good, so. And yeah. are they sticking, hold on, what's it? Sorry, Tom, but the, I just wanted to know, are they sticking to the same hotels and the destinations, same exact ones? So far, I've not had a lot of movement um, unless a particular hotel in a particular destination is closed and they want to stick with those dates because that's their honeymoon date or their wedding date, then that's when they're moving and changing destinations and hotels, typically within the same chain, though. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Tom, you were saying? Yeah, two things. One, um, for the clients, we do have some clients who, uh, I'm not saying they have a sense of entitlement necessarily, but they definitely have some questions which are logical like oh my gosh in this area of time you know aren't airfares so much cheaper aren't hotel rates so much cheaper shouldn't they be giving us more stuff and the answer is no and the reason and we explain to them airlines have cut 60 percent of their flights so there's less planes traveling to destinations now which makes the flights actually not necessarily cheaper but actually the same price are actually more expensive st lucia is a great destination which never had the lift that uh, some of the other islands like Jamaica or even like Mexico may have mm -hmm. enjoyed, right? So mm -hmm. therefore there's only limited flights going to St. Lucia. Those flight prices aren't going to drop dramatically by any stretch of the imagination. Same thing with the resorts for, for guests or for couples that think they're going to get more may not necessarily get that because now the availability for 2021 is actually kind of slim right now because everyone's moved their dates. So there's not much incentive for those resorts to be giving more. But what they are giving, which we found is really, really good, is they're relaxing um, stipulations, like, for example, penalties, attritions, right? So the cancel dates, the release dates, they're being more flexible with, final payment dates. So these are things that I think advisors can definitely ask uh, when they're negotiating for these types of uh, destination weddings, is maybe relax those some of those penalties and policies. But those are the things I think that can be worked. And if I may add as well, I do think it's more than ever, I, I, and I think it's such a great time for travel professionals to really show what they're made of. And I mean that respectfully, um, because more than ever, you need an expert. You need an expert to wade through all the options. You need an expert to show you the economics, because even a destination wedding, I mean, how much is a destination wedding in your neck of the woods, Kim, Tom? It's well over 20,000, wouldn't you say? Yeah, on average. Yeah. So the fact of the matter is you could certainly make your way to any of the, the islands in, in Jamaica. I mean, 
let, let's add, um, there's like Zuma as well. There is Greece. Um, I know Bali is on my bucket list as well. But it's more than ever, I think a travel professional has to have, you know those little cue cards that your, your doctor would have with your file? Basically your tastes and preferences. I don't mean it literally, but it's for you to know what that person needs. And for example, I, I will give you a Jamaican example. Um, I think properties like the Round Hills, the Jamaica Inn, the Half Moons, where you have that separate secluded space. And I can think of examples right throughout the Caribbean, but you have your own villa, you have your own, let's say your villa team, I want to say villa staff, but your team uh, that, that prepares all your meals. So there's there's no buffet, it's all, it's all done for you. But certainly, I think there is that clientele that needs that added intimacy, that seclusion, that peace of mind. And, and certainly you want to also, as a bride, the psychology of a bride, for example, or, or, or if you're honeymooning, you want your moment. This is your time. And so I find a lot of the, the hotels now, as I, as I scan the options, are also adding additional amenities to the um, to the suites, to the villas. And so there is more value in what you're actually purchasing. And I, I think that that is going to be up to the travel professional to position that accordingly based on who you have in front of you. That brings me to a question that we were speaking about prior to you know the, the webinar going live. And I know Tom had something interesting to say, and Richard, you as well. So are you guys seeing clients book more buyouts of entire resorts so that the whole wedding party can enjoy themselves without having to adhere to certain restrictions within their own party? Tom, you had an interesting note about that. Yeah, so for resorts, I think it's a, it's a completely different animal than villas, for example. Resorts tend to be larger, even if even the smaller resorts tend to be larger. So buying out an entire resort if it's even if it's a smaller one 60 to 80 or 60 to 90 rooms one there's a financial liability on the couple that they fill that space even if they don't fill the space they have to pay for the space the entire mm -hmm. resort but a lot of times the resorts have minimum night requirements so a lot of buyouts may be seven nights where an average destination wedding may be three to five nights so the couple may not be up for doing that kind of stuff so buying out an entire resort we don't find that much going forward buying out if the weddings become smaller, like um, you know, 20 to 40 guests, I think the villa option becomes incredibly attractive, where you can buy a villa and stipulate the length of time, have the guests come in early, stay later. It can be a remarkable experience for a small wedding. And I know St. Lucia has a number of fantastic villas that exactly fit that. Perfect. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think the very bones of St. Lucia, for example, like let me not compare St. Lucia because you know she's gorgeous. But I'm talking about if you are in your own sanctuary at Jade Mountain, overlooking the iconic UNESCO World Heritage Site with a 900 square foot extravagant infinity edge pool for you and the love of your life, or as Tom said earlier, which we can't say on the air. Um, I mean, butler service. You have your five-star amenities, your jacuzzi overlooks that same view and you can certainly stargaze. What more do you need? Especially, I can tell you the number of nights, maximum number of nights that folks have stayed in a Jade Mountain Sanctuary is five nights. Without, uh, five days I should say, without coming out. I mean, what are you coming out for? But uh, talking about East Winds that has 30 cottages in the garden, you could do a buyout on that. Because let me tell you, I'm from the old school. I worked at resorts where the entertainment team had to be the witness. That's when elopements were running rapid. And I think elopements are coming in in this particular phase or season immediately post COVID. And I do think the size of wedding parties for destination weddings will, will increase again. But I do think it's somewhat being contained at the moment. But the bottom line I'm saying is in St. Lucia, for example, 
There's so many hotels that have 30 cottages, 29 sanctuaries at Jade, 37 at Ladera, 49 at Cap Maison. It's, it's a viable buyout, but let's make a note of Tom's point. More than ever, you need an expert because the expert will know the restrictions and the obligations to, to weigh the options for that particular couple. And that's why we use a travel professional, right? No, definitely. This, I think, travel professionals, travel advisors have really shown what they're made of, and people are really going to go to them much more than before, definitely. You have to look at some silver lining, right, out of all of this? Right. So um, we've heard from advisors that uh, some people are now, some couples are now separating their destination weddings and their honeymoons. Is this something you've seen? Tom, you seem to be nodding your head, so you're saying they might be doing this and then waiting a year or so and why what are the reasons for this so um we actually try to think outside the box and try to make it a multi-trip as possible kim always jokes how i'm pretty good about making one trip into three trips right <laughs> but what we do is really we convince the bride and groom. so for every destination wedding we do we convince them like they need to go somewhere else for their mini moon like don't stay on the same site as your honey as your destination wedding that's a great opportunity for advisors to sell them on a three to five night mini moon, if you will, where they can go immediately somewhere afterward. Because who wants that aunt tapping some of your wife on the shoulder, you know, the next day after your wedding going, what you doing for lunch? Where are you guys having dinner? Right. Nobody wants that. Right. So we always tell our clients, tell the bride and groom, as soon as the wedding is done, the following morning, get up, have lunch, have brunch with your family and get the heck out. And we're not going to tell them where you're going. And almost 100 percent of our clients greedy to that mini moon immediately after so we book them somewhere else in destination for three to five nights and then we plan a more proper honeymoon if you will three months six months whatever happens a year later where they can be an elongated process because sometimes for the sake of argument they may not want the destination for their wedding to be the destination for their honeymoon yeah of course yes. Makes sense. But also, yeah. also there's some really convenient hotel combos as well, which I like. So, for example, let's say um, um, the Royaltons tend to do that quite a bit, where you will have the hideaway um, on the same property. So you can be booked there. You can head over to everybody for the rehearsal dinner, even for the wedding, because there might be children. We have a lot of mixed families now. Um, but then you can always escape and they're not allowed so um quite a number of those options as well i, I love that concept tom we we you again you have to know exactly who you're who you're dealing with what their nuances are yeah mate, you have something and i would say especially in saint lucia we do that a lot i have a wedding at royalton saint lucia next year well it's supposed to be this year but um it's been moved to next year and then they are actually doing they are doing two separate trips they're do, going to tikai for a couple of days and on to jade mountain so they're doing a little bit of a, around saint lucia and i think that's one of the destinations that's really good because of the different areas you can have a completely different experience the split is good and also between islands as well you can do um, very convenient hops from barbados over to saint lucia because the thing is um, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Sometimes, you know, you want two different things, but you could also split on the very same island. So you arrive, let's say, in the south, you fly to the north on the helicopter transfer. That's another thing, by the way. A lot of folks are looking for the expedited airport service. And I'm very happy that that is being offered by so many more um, airports because that really does make you feel like a VIP especially if you separate yourself from the crowd, but also the helicopter transfers or the luxury um, ground transfers. Those are, those are also very exciting as well. Yeah, so, so to Richard's point, I mean, again, going back to the, the value of travel agents, if you book on Expedia or God forbid, you book directly with one of the hotel websites for their, you're not gonna know about helicopter transfer availability in St. Lucia, right? And that's the stuff that clients are gonna remember that when they get off, they have this amazing experience very Instagrammable, by the way, but they can post that they were in a helicopter for 18 minutes flying right over the majestic Piton Mountains before landing at the resort and being with like royalty to their resort, which is 20 minutes now away, right? You don't get that on Expedia. You don't get that from Costco. You get that from your travel agent who's been to St. Lucia and knows the ins and outs of how to create that experience for you. 
Yeah, those are the points that travel advisors have to remember to, yeah. And may I add that that is that is our job as travel professionals. Confidence always inspires confidence. And, and as I see travel professionals jumping on planes responsibly with their mask and and posting it on social, it is also helping to inspire that confidence, even if they're just going to Florida. I don't mean to make Florida sound like a bad place. Sorry, uh, Baloba, I know that's where you are. Um, but I mean that, um, and certainly we see staycations are, are increasingly popular, road trips as well. Um, but I do think that that's such a critical element of the role of travel professionals. It is inspiring that confidence, taking that lead. And I will have to say that digital is no longer a trend, my friends. It is how we live. So let's all get a digital footprint. Let's entice folks with the imagery that we get. And I want you all to use up your tourist boards so much more. Sorry, I got into a little lecture there. Sorry, Paloma. <laughs> it's fun. It's awesome. It's actually great points for travel advisors to remember. It's also the confidence and passion, a lot of passion for what you do or for the country or for the destination hotel you're um, promoting. Now, Richard, uh, this is a question for you, and then obviously Kim and Tom can jump in. What does a destination, because uh, you had some great points for one of the articles that I wrote, what does a destination wedding look like in this new normal? Normal, smaller parties, no buffets, et cetera, et cetera. Can you kind of give us a feel of what they're going to be looking like moving forward? Yes, and I, and I do think that um, it is all dependent on the, um, the um, clients. Um, what we do boast a lot in St. Lucia is that we have some excellent um, wedding and event planners, and those are the folks that really can take the headache out of a process because the one thing a bride wants beyond her moment is that she wants it to, to be seamless. And so having someone who is connected locally is really an excellent asset to have. We are finding that initially um, in the immediate, um, let's say the next two months, you're seeing a lot more smaller, smaller parties. And I think that's perfectly fine. Um, so you're seeing elopements, you're seeing the interest for folks to bring just their besties. So in other words, you can have the wedding now have the folks you really need there now or can get there now because let's be honest some of our family members are not confident and who knows some of the millennials some of the gen x's are not confident it's a personal choice and so you're seeing smaller numbers generally but you are seeing the elaborate decor so you're seeing um, the trends they still want it to be special it needs to speak to who they are as a couple so there are folks that want something very very rustic um, versus folks that need something ultra um, the traditional luxury right um, you're also seeing a lot of requests for independent spaces and that also speaks to the villa concept that um, um tom mentioned earlier to be able to stay in a villa invite folks over because there are some fabulous entertainment space by a pool deck overlooking the ocean etc um i mean this is anywhere in the world right um to then being able to have the ceremony right there with a trusted team that you that greeted you when you first checked in, that is part of what we're also seeing. And so um, I see a number of the um, villa and short-term rental folks also getting into the conversations of how they can alter their products to attract even more business. But apart from that, you are seeing that desire for seclusion, um, you're seeing people wanting to get away from the resort, so an independent space, and you're absolutely going to be seeing social distancing um, play out as well. But apart from that, you're seeing it still being very special and to the taste of the couple. That is not changing because love, it doesn't change. 
Kim, Tom, are you guys seeing um, the setups for next year in terms of, at all, anything? Or are people asking for smaller, you know, tables with less people? You know, what are the social distancing protocols and whatnot? Yeah, um, from some of the resorts, we're starting to get info. It's coming in, you know, a little slowly right now, but I've heard some resorts are going to only be able, and this might be a phase one, phase two thing, but have they can only have tables with four people, even at the wedding and reception and things like that. Not having centerpieces, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. And, um, you know, just again, making sure they're in a secluded part of the resort to kind of keep them away from the other guests and things of that nature. So I suspect that the brides and grooms will be doing a lot of work with their planners over the upcoming months to adapt to those new strategies. And I think it's really also dependent on the destination and what their requirements are at the time of the wedding. Um, so that's a big thing. And we've actually seen a little bit of a kind of interesting reverse trend there. We've had some honeymooners who are now looking because their wedding, their local wedding has been pushed out a year potentially. They are looking to actually do an elopement in the destination. When it was supposed to be their honeymoon, they're now turning that into an elopement and um, we'll still have their wedding locally the following year, but they're like, we wanna get married on this day. So we've got some of those we're working on. Tom, are you seeing? Yeah, to Kim's point, interesting, one of our destination weddings we signed in March in the start of this whole coronavirus was actually someone who had to cancel their wedding because of, you know, stipulations in the United States. And they said, let's just do a destination wedding and have more people. I mean, we're going to postpone it anyway. So that ended up being a really great opportunity from making a wedding into a destination wedding. So be, have those conversations with your with your clients, I'm talking to travel advisors. If you're postponing your weddings, we'll add, give them other options and let them know that there is possible ways to save them a ton of money. Destination weddings, as we all know, can save couples a ton of money by being in destination, having fewer guests, having them pay their own way, etc. We all know the value of that. And, I, and, and please let them know that it may be much cheaper, um, just as travel professionals have been very instrumental over the, I would say, over the last five to six years on letting folks who had never been to an all-inclusive understand the value of paying one price um, you also can help them to understand the benefits of a destination wedding um, but i also want to add that an excellent marketing strategy can also be to offer a fabulous um, registry so everybody knows that everybody might not be able to make the trip but certainly as as members of families and friends we want to still contribute to say this is this is my you know here is my token and so a honeymoon registry for example where you purchase a private transfer or you purchase a spa treat a couple's massage chocolate infused i might add hello um that could be really very special it could make it more inclusive um and people could feel a little bit more satisfied until of course you can all come together and celebrate again because the bottom line is if you can't take everyone to the destination let's say there is a restriction of 50 packs which is what the cdc is saying in terms of group gatherings at the moment which could change after i've said it um then you can have a big celebration after so my my biggest thing is travel professionals have to lead the way to say this is your love let's do something when you're comfortable it could be in the fall it could be december it could be winter but after that when let's say let's say there is a vaccine and and things go back to normal then we plan for a huge thing i don't know what we'll call it but it doesn't matter everybody's invited to that one okay so to so that point there's actually a, a question from uh one of the audience members uh, they are asking, will many of our guests, I, they're concerned, and maybe you've seen this concern from your clients, people traveling to St. Lucia, will many of our guests get stuck while in transit, especially for destination weddings, where many guests are coming from other countries? 
So what have you, have you guys received those type of questions? You know, you have people, different people coming. Is there now, you know, especially now with U.S. picking up again, what's going to, you know, what, what are, have you heard this concern? I think it's a legitimate fear. I mean, I, I, again, as travel advisors, I, I strongly believe it's not our jobs to convince anybody to do anything. It's our jobs to educate our clients, give them as much information as possible. I think it's important for us to change our invoices or include on in our invoices language that says we are not responsible if you get quarantined in destination. I think it's important for us to set appropriate um, expectations around what the current uh, entry requirements are. So if you test high, in temperature, if you may be pulled aside for an additional test, and if you do get tested, you may be separated from your family. And if you still want to go, go, right? Um, I saw the craziest thing today, I don't know if anybody else saw it, but Cambodia came out with their requirement today that if somebody tests positive for COVID, the entire plane will be quarantined, which I thought was absolutely ludicrous. I mean, but basically what they're telling you is very simple. What does it tell you? Don't come, right? So again, I think, you know, I think some of the destinations are gonna are, are really gonna do this. And I think a lot of the ones in the Caribbean specifically right now are testing the waters. I think they're all testing to see who's got the best practices in place. They're kind of looking at each other to see, you know, are you charging for the test? Are you not charging for the test? Are you charging for quarantine? Are you not charging for quarantine? It's a as as Richard said earlier, it's fluid for sure. And I think we're all trying to stay on top of our game as much as possible. It's unfolding, and I think we just have to stay um, abreast of the developments. But I absolutely agree with you, Tom, in terms of the posture. We need to be smart and protect ourselves with language, but also to be personal enough that we are literally, I mean, I, I was very realistic with an agent yesterday, and I said, there is absolutely no way I'm going to allow you to do final payment without having all the details. That's not a responsibility um, I believe that anyone in my position should take. And so at the end of the day, you have to provide the information and then a decision is made. And, and I do think that everyone in the context of COVID understands that this is just not a situation we're in control of. We're just not so we have to have to be able to flex as well but having that personal um, connection and care which is what travel agents do so well there are very few places i find where customer service still exists and i, I really want to thank you again travel professionals love that yeah i think everybody's aware that it's just such a fluid situation and it really truly changes day by day where you think we have this under control and then something comes up and not so much. But yeah, it's true what you say, Tom. It looks like the Caribbean is testing the waters and see who's what's the best practices here and then learn from each other as well, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so going on to the next question. Um, so which have been traditionally, besides St. Lucia, because we know it's amazing, been the most popular destinations among your clients for destination weddings? And do you think post-COVID these same ones will continue to be the most popular? Um, so I would say for me, most of my weddings end up being in Mexico or Jamaica and definitely some St. Lucia ones, those tend to be a little smaller, but um, at this point, I don't know so much that the destinations will vary so much because all of those are easy to get to. They've had good protocol in place. Um, Again, we might see a little shift in the type of accommodations they're looking for, but I see the destinations standing. Um, I mean, those are great destinations because of all the all-inclusive product. And while you would think maybe a lot of people would want to get married in Hawaii, I think any of us who've looked into those options know that it's not the most cost-effective way to go. While it's a great destination, I, I still think with some of the ones down in the Caribbean and Mexico, that's where they're getting the most value for their money. And that's honestly what people are after at the end of the day is value for their money. Of course, safety is important, but they're not going to spend triple the amount to go somewhere else. Yeah, for, for me as well, I echo Kim 100%. Um, the majority of our weddings happens to be in Mexico. Uh, there is a tremendous range of resorts there that fit all sorts of budgets and requirements. So because of the higher amounts, pure supply and demand, 
huge supply, so therefore they're very competitive. They're all seeking the agent's business, so therefore they're willing to give more. They're willing to negotiate more, additional amenities. So we pick resorts that tend to give more for our clients, number one, and also are more flexible, especially in times like this. I mean, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, the last 90 days has really shown us who's become really good partners and who we probably will never do business with again, right? Both in terms of destinations as well as resorts. And and unfortunately, those are the things that we're not going to forget, unfortunately, very easily. I'm not saying this in a negative way or a positive way, but it's a fact, right? The resorts that were willing to take care of us, willing to protect us, willing to look after our clients, they're the ones we're, that are going to continue to get our business for sure going forward. So from a destination wedding perspective, destinations like Mexico and Jamaica, because they have more resorts, tend to be there. St. Lucia is also top on our list as well. But they have very fewer resorts and fewer resorts that can accommodate large numbers of guests. Therefore. We don't have that as a destination as much, but th those are typically requirements. And um, so what are the do's and don'ts when you are speaking to some of these clients in terms of destination weddings? Like what, or what's been, you know, your ultimate destination wedding or where you might have made a few mistakes? If somebody wants to take that. I think uh, it's important for us as travel consultants to be true consultants so my background part of my job was a consulting in um in b2b and 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 finance and I, I think it's important for us to ask the right questions up front so do ask the hard questions up front so that you set expectations appropriately right so make sure they understand that if they bring x number of guests to the table they can get y they can get so many things comped and so forth if that's one of their objectives some couples have no interest in the extras or the amenities or a lower price. They want the experience that they've always dreamt of, which is perfectly fine. But make sure you ask them clarifying questions to understand what's driving them. Because if you find out what's driving them, you will hit a home run 100% of the time. Make sure you find out what the budget is for their guests. It's super, super important, right? I will never forget the destination wedding that I did. This is the only one that's ever happened. I had a very, very selfish couple who said, we don't really care if anybody else comes but this is the one we want. They picked a resort that was not cheap, but fairly expensive. And even the bride's mother couldn't afford to come. I mean, the whole wedding ended up going completely down the tubes because not anybody could afford that wedding uh, destination. So they ended up going, you know, a completely different direction, at, but canceling the wedding. So make sure it's something that you're, that's attainable for everybody. So those are coming some of the dues. Kim? Um, yeah, I would totally agree with that. Um, and I think, you know, like Tom was saying, ask the questions, but also make sure they know your experience and your relationships and how that benefits them. And, you know, just being able to get things done, especially during this difficult time or more challenging time, that you're really there to be an advocate for them and help guide them through the process and not even just them, their guests, because you're dealing with a lot of people who aren't really attached to the planning of the wedding. And um, actually right before this call, I got off the call with um, a bride and a groom who were scheduled to go to Turks and Caicos in November for a wedding. And, you know, we talked about some things that they were hearing from their guests, um, you know, just like, booking airline arrangements because a lot of the flights from their areas have been canceled. So that gives me the knowledge I need to kind of get ahead of these guests and try to assist them better. And hopefully down the road, not only does that provide them with a great experience for this wedding, but hopefully it will give me some future business with the guests too. Excellent. Yes, Richard? I mean, I think Tom and Kim said it all. That's sales 101. And people care about who they do business with um, we, more than ever. And that's why social is so popular. There's no, I mean, it's not a surprise that social is popular. Social is popular because we want to know what our friends trust. Because if I trust Kim, then I'm going to trust where she sends her folks for a wedding. Now, my thing is, I think it's also um, important because when Kim is going to send someone to a resort and she knows that general manager, she knows his MO, how he operates, she knows the sales manager, whoever it is, she knows she can add value and she knows if there's an issue and we all should live in the real world and we do, I know we do on this, you know. Um, 
And that's a critical part. So telling is never selling. It really, as Tom mentioned, about that consultation. And again, that also will determine whether Aruba is the right island for you. That's going to connect with your soul. Everything is never for everyone. Exuma might be the thing where you go swimming with the pigs. You know, it may be Indonesia. If you love flora and fauna like I do, it could be New Zealand. So, I mean, the point is really having that consultation is very important because there are some boring honeymoons out there. Um, about them on time, but I think that they never use a travel professional. And I thank you. Yes, Tom. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of don'ts, I would encourage travel advisors, don't do what you don't want to do, right? Like, I'll give you a great example, but do it in a nice way. Like, for example, <laughs> I always tell my destination wedding couples, I'm not a wedding planner, right? I'm married. I picked out the colors of linens and tablecloths once and I hated it. I definitely don't want to be involved in you picking out table colors of tables and cloths and linens and don't that's a reason for me never to get married again right so for that reason i don't want to be involved in your wedding planning process in the least bit you've got a wedding planner at the resort that's going to help you through that if you need an escalation i'm happy for here to, to be there for you but i'd rather not be on every single call discussing colors and flowers and all that other stuff now if that's your forte if you love doing that absolutely do it and by the way if you're doing it maybe charge a fee for it Right? Don't get compensated for your time. But again, think about the things you are going to do that you're not going to do. I say it the way that I say it as more of a joke so they understand. So I'm not being like, no, I'm not going to do this. That comes across the wrong way. But if I say it as a joke, they laugh with me just like you guys did. And therefore, they understand this is not my forte. Travel agent is my forte. I will book them, make sure they have an exceptional experience. If you don't want to book flights, don't book flights. Let them know that the flights that their clients are going to find are going to be the exact same flights that you find. So therefore, if it's no benefit to you or your agency to book flights, then don't book flights. We book flights for other reasons, but part of the true, the full service concept. But again, if that's not something you want to do, set that expectation with uh, the bride and groom of what you can and cannot do. And I think that's really important. Wow, these are all great, great points. Thank you so much. So we're going to jump into the Q&A session. This is, these are the questions from the audience. This one is for you, Richard. I have honeymooners going to St. Lucia in late October. What is the best source of information for COVID protocols? Fabulous. So it's always going to be our website um, because that's where we'll put everything. We just find that that is a central spot. We're currently um, making a few revisions, which are not yet out, um, because we do listen to you. As I mentioned um, before, we love to take the temperature test and to find out exactly what you're seeing so that we can then adjust accordingly. So our website, stlucia.org, is always going to be your very best resource. But again, as I mentioned, do always know who is at the tourist board for the various um, destinations. I'm speaking to everybody else now. But um, thank you very much for the business. And I'll certainly be able to share my email address as well um, for some one-on-one, -on -one, or you can see me on Facebook. We have a Facebook group as well, where you can also ask peer-to-peer -peer questions. It's called St. Lucia Travel Agents. It's important because then you're getting um, opinions from your peers as well, which we, we primarily just moderate that group as well. Thank yeah, you for your question. There's, a, there's another question. Um, when will St. Lucia open for North Americans? St. Lucia is currently open to North Americans. Um, we've been getting a lot of private jets and also a lot of repatriation flights. But through a number of scheduled airline changes, our flights are going to be starting up American and Delta on the 9th of July at this time. And then you can expect JetBlue on the 13th. But again, folks, please always be in touch with the airlines and certainly with your hotels as well. We have a number of our hotels that are in the process of being certified as well. And I want to make sure that the hotel that you're discussing with your potential clients, your prospects, are the ones that are going to be open for that time as well. That's, a, that's an important thing to navigate as well for all destinations. 
okay? Because it is a bit of a process, but we are currently open to um, North American, um, well, the US currently, because Canada clearly has um, their borders closed at this time. So this question is for Kim and Tom. Generally, do you reserve your destination weddings with wholesalers or with the property directly and why? Tom and I both love this question, so we could go on for hours. Um, I am I use wholesalers 100% of the time. Um, they are a partner just like we are a partner to our tourism boards, our clients. Um, they help us, you know, when things aren't the easiest. And I know there's been a lot of challenges with all this going down and long wait times and refunds, but at the end of the day, those things are situational and they still have our backs and they help us through the process. And I think the most important thing is, of course, the partnership we have with them. But the more business you put with them, the more, the higher your commission rate will go each year. So if you're booking all these individual hotels direct, you're never going to build that relationship and that revenue with the tour operator. And that's such a key piece because you know, the more revenue you have with them, the higher your commission is. So I'll stop. I'm sure Tom has a lot to add to that too, because we could go on for days about this. I, I, I think it's more of a philosophical question for me, to be frankly honest with you. Um, like Kim said, to answer the question, 100% through wholesalers. And, and the ph philosophical point that I want to make is a tour operator is a middle man. They really are. We could book direct with any hotel chain that we want to. Similarly, we, travel advisors, are middlemen. Our client literally will not get, for the most part, a cheaper price if they book with us and if they book direct with some of the chains out there, for example, that price fix. So what advantage is it by booking through a middleman, like us, for example? Well, we add service, we add expertise, we add points of escalation if things are needed, we negotiate on their behalf. Same thing with the tour operators. And as Kim mentioned earlier, if you can't, uh, if you cannot book with, the, if you, sorry, if you can book with a tour operator and you have the notion of double dipping, why wouldn't you, right? I, I see on all these travel agent boards about people saying, oh, you can book direct with these people, you get so much more. I don't think you get so much more. I mean, there are certain instances recently during COVID-19 where us working with a tour operator and getting changes and cancellations done worked so much faster than if we had gone direct and been on hold with, for hours with the hotels or some of the hotels weren't even answering their phone lines. So again, like Kim said, 100% the tour operators, if you can't book a property that a tour operator doesn't offer, I encourage you to reach out to one of your trusted tour operators to see if they can get a contract. You'd be surprised. Sometimes they're going to be able to negotiate that. In the event you can't, reach out to the tourism board, reach out to the resort, see what you can negotiate on your own. Excellent. Wow, those are great points. Um, so another question is, has anyone seen resorts offering live streaming for those unable to attend destination weddings? Is this a new trend that you're seeing? Yeah, I That's think they've always had that. Yeah. Yep. Not only the hotels, but the audio video department of most hotels will allow you to do that. And today with Facebook's, you know, live and Zoom and everything else, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Right. So... Oh, okay, so this question is for Richard. Uh, St. Lucia is asking guests to have a negative code test, COVID test within 48 hours of their travel. Is it difficult to get results of a test back quickly? So I have clients wishing to cancel trips over this. Is this something they should be canceling trips over? What do you think, Richard? What's your thoughts on this? So as I mentioned before, that is what was presented and um, based on the feedback. And, and I, I want to sort of explain that um, the whole testing across the U.S. has not quite gone the way that we anticipated at that time. And certainly in the middle of June, we were making these decisions and all you can do is make your decisions based on the information that's available. And so I'm not being defensive about it, but just trying to share that. Um, but just be aware, there. I've just put my email in the um, chat because the earlier question I answered, I wasn't sure if I came across a little insensitive by saying the website. The website will have um, or current 
um, details for you to stay updated, but we're always willing to take your emails and your phone calls and even a Facebook call, absolutely. So I've put it up there and I would love to chat with you one on one and let's see what might be the best um, approach for um, these particular clients. But as I mentioned as well, and I'm sworn to secrecy, we are currently um, working on um, proposed revisions for that. All right, so can we have a little bit more patience and your time, please, while we work through that? And I'll be, as soon as I know, I'm going to shout it from the mountain tops. But there is my email address. Please drop me a line, and I'll be very happy to help you to navigate. Thank you, Tom. Well, behave. I, really quickly, since I since I got you, on, yeah, since I've got you here and on the spot, I'm going to challenge you, Richard. Since you work for the St. Lucia, Lucia Tourism Authority, the 48 hours can be really, really tough, especially for a destination oh. like St. Lucia. If you get married on a Saturday or Sunday, that means mm -hmm. you'd have to get tested like on a Thursday or Friday, and people don't leave till Monday, which will have passed the 48 hours. So, because you work in the unique position that you do, if you can speak to the right. powers that be to extend that 48 to at least 72 or beyond, I think that would be greatly helpful. Would 72 be helpful, Tom? At the very minimum. Okay. So, Tom, just to go back, because um, absolutely, we got that feedback loud and clear, and that is why we um, went to look at some revisions. So I'll keep you posted on that. Promise. Good. Thank awesome. you. That's awesome. So uh, this last question I'm going to direct Kim, it's from the audience because I know you're going there next month. So what are the, the experiences with clients going to Mexico in July? What are you thinking it's going to be like? <laughs> Um, we, I have had a few travel advisor friends already there and they said it was great, you know, mask on the airplane. We all know that. Um, and I believe I even read today, they're not doing any temperature checks in the airport. Someone correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think I just read that. And the resorts are doing them. The resorts are being so thorough, spraying luggage down. Um, the transportation company that we use in Mexico, they're doing that as soon as you arrive. They're sanitizing your luggage, sanitizing the bottoms of your shoes, um, you know, giving you hand sanitizer and making sure all those things are taken care of. But overall, hearing very good results. Um, currently, they're restricted to 30% occupancy, so resorts are not very crowded. And um, but for the most part, it seems like a lot of the activities and, you know, swim up bars at a good majority of the resorts that are currently open are open. I know not all of them are, but um, we're seeing pretty good results there because the resorts are empty. Social distancing is very easy to do, which is nice. Um, I know when I go next month, I'm waiting for an extended stay to Mexico for a variety of reasons. but. Um, I will be staying at four different resorts and be, you know, touring a handful of others as well. So looking forward to getting back on that airplane. I've never been so excited to book an airline ticket in my life last week. But you're holding true to what Richard said. Show confidence and go out there and show out your talent. That's what we need. So um, that's amazing. This webinar has been great. You guys have had great great information to tell all our audience so we're wrapping up so i just wanted to point the audience to remind them that we host recommend host the saint lucia romance expert program and it's available on edu.recommend.com the program puts the spotlight on romantic resorts top places around the island for proposing where to go for destination weddings active honeymoons even bachelor and bachelorette parties and hidden corners, which St. Lucia has a lot of, and um, spa retreats and the whole, the whole spectrum of beautiful romantic options. You can go to edu.recommend.com. So thank you all for attending the webinar and thank you Richard, Kim and Tom for providing such insight and such expertise on romance travel and the crisis the world is currently facing, which we will slowly, slowly get out of. Stay safe and stay healthy. And thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye.